Okay, I am gonna, it's my pleasure to introduce, thank you, thanks. To introduce our next two speakers. Um, Karen Fishman and Maya Lerman from the Library of Congress. Um, their presentation is called Not Just Talking to Myself, Studs Terkel's Music Interviews. So uh, I'll introduce both of them and then they're gonna um, also share the presentation. Um, Karen Fishman, many of you know her, is reference librarian and archivist at the Recorded Sound section of the Library of Congress. She provides research assistance to Congress staff and, public, and the public for all areas of recorded sound, including music performance, re recording history and technology, radio broadcasting, audio preservation, and rights and copyright issues. Uh, what else is there? <laughs> uh, she has given presentations on the library sound recording collections at local universities and at national and regional conferences. She's currently serving as co-chair of the ARSC Education and Training Committee and co-president of the Washington, D.C. Uh, Metropolitan Chapter of ARSC. She's served on committees for many uh, organizations, including MAREC, the Mid-Atlantic Archives, um, Mid-Atlantic Regional Archives Conference, and SAA, the Society of American Archivists, among others. She's a graduate of the University of Maryland with a master's degree in library science with an archives concentration. And Maya Lerman is a, a library technician in the recorded sound section of the Library of Congress, where she processes archival collections, catalogs, commercial recordings, and provides research support for recorded sound reference staff. She has a particular passion for American folk music and has interned at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress and the Ralph Rinzer Archives of the Smithsonian uh, Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. While completing her master's degree um, in library uh, science at Indiana University, she worked for the Sound Directions Project at, um, at the Archives of Traditional Music uh, at the Lilly Library. Uh, she's been a member of ARSC since 2009 and is also a member of IASA. She currently serves on the ARSC Education and Training Committee also. And as a singer and guitarist, she's released her first album uh, in 2012 called Take This Song With You. So uh, please welcome. <laughs> so first we're going to hear from Karen. <clears throat> and I'm going to, as promised, have this all glitch free here for you. Okay. Oop. And I'm going to go back to the beginning. Okay. Thanks so much. I don't do technology. I just do content. So um, <laughs> thanks for your help, Kim. And good morning. Over the years, Studs Terkel produced a vast collection of recorded oral histories and interviews that reflect the expertise and eclectic interests in music, literature, art, history, and politics. Our presentation today will showcase highlights from the Studs Terkel collection, focusing on his interviews with musicians and some others. Um, we're going to talk about Mr. Terkel and, the contribution, and his contributions to music and oral history. We'll describe the collection and the library's partnership with the Chicago History Museum, and then play some examples of how the recordings reveal a deeper understanding of the performers and their music. We'll conclude by posing some potential questions researchers might want to pursue as the record, more recordings become available. Um, a little background about Studs. He was one of the most uh, best known and influential interviewers and practitioners of oral history. As a radio program host, news commentator, sportscaster, and disc jockey, as well as the Pulitzer Prize winning author, he observed and documented people's thoughts and opinions throughout the 20th century. Engaged in a lifelong conversation with America, he earned the title of the nation's most prolific oral historian. Turkle was widely credited with transforming oral history into a popular literary form. He also liked to think of himself as a raconteur, a teller of stories for public entertainment, someone who didn't want to just interview people, but have a conversation with them. And according to author and music critic Anthony DeCurtis, Studs viewed the opportunity of speaking to others as an adventure, a journey of discovery, a continued source of delightful surprise. In addition to his work in television and radio, Turkle wrote a total of 18 books. 
These works documented the lives and stories of many Americans and the issues they faced. His books examined the Great Depression, World War II, race relations, working life in the American dream, as well as focusing on music and performers. Turkle was born in the Bronx in 1912 on May 16th. Last Thursday would have been his birthday. At an early age, his family settled in Chicago where his mother took over the management of a rooming house and later a residential hotel. Turgle has said his formative education came from living and working in the hotel and by listening to the spirited discussions that occurred nightly amongst the working class residents. This helped shape his views of the world. After graduating from the University of Chicago, he went to law school, passed the bar, but never practiced. Instead, after working many different kind of jobs, he joined the radio division of the WPA Federal Writers Project. He wrote scripts for programs that aired on the Chicago radio station WGN. It was also that, at this time, Turkle auditioned for and found work as an actor, most often playing a gangster. Um, I believe it was Mug uh, Buster Malo Malone or Muggsy Malone on popular radio serials. I tried to find some. He was on um, Woman in White, Ma Perkins. We didn't have any in the library's collection, but um, I hope to find some and add it to, um, to our collection. Back home in Chicago, after a brief stint in the Army, he landed a job writing scripts for Great Americans, which was a radio program airing on WGN. By 1945, he found work as a disc jockey on station WCFL, and later that year, he was host of his own program, The Wax Museum, on WENR. About The Wax Museum, Turkle has said, whatever piece of music caught my fancy, I offered it to the listener, no matter what the genre. The show was a success, and from then on, Turkle was known for his music interviews and his expertise. A big break came his way in 1949. Turkle became the star of Studs Place, a television show about life in a diner. This was a good example of the Chicago school style of television. The cast of Studs Place improvised their lines and worked without a script, using only a brief outline of a plot for a guide. The cast included Beverly Younger, Chet Robel, Wynn Strachey, and Turkle. By 1952, it was off the air. I found this doing another project, and I thought I'd show it. Um, he, as a new television star, he, he and his family were featured in a spread from Radio and TV Mirror. Mirror. This is 1951. Trickle was hired by station WFMT in 1952 to host a music show. Adding what came naturally to him, he started to include interviews, and the show grew into the award-winning Studs Turkle program, which broadcast daily for 45 years. His guests on the show ranged from local Chicagoans to international figures, historians, writers, musicians, social activists, and labor organizers. Through his radio program, he was able to support many artists, such as Mahalia Jackson, Bill Big Brunzi, and Pete Seeger, and helped to promote their musical careers. Now it's Maya's turn to finish up. <laughs> Since May of 2010, the Library of Congress and the Chicago History Museum have been partners on a major project to digitally preserve and catalog the unique recordings from the Studs Turkle collection. The collection consists of approximately 7,000 sound recordings, which include most of Turkle's book interviews and WFMT radio programs. The WFMT radio programs comprise over 5,800 open reel tapes, both seven and 10 inch, and the book interview recordings include about 800 open reel tapes and 1,300 cassettes. To preserve the recordings, the library is creating master and derivative files for both the Library of Congress and the Chicago History Museum. File names will be added to the museum's inventory database so that they can match the original tapes with the digital files. And after the project is completed, the original sound recordings will be returned to the Chicago History Museum. 
From an early age, Turkel was enthusiastic about music and educated himself about a wide variety of musical genres. He had a particular passion for opera, jazz, and blues. Chicago being such a rich musical city um, offered Turkel a diverse environment to pursue and seek out live music. Through his radio programs, Turkel could satisfy his curiosity about music and performers, and he could introduce his audience to music that they might not have been familiar with. He interviewed both unknown and famous musicians, which illustrated his belief that every person had an interesting story to tell. Turkle's fascination and curiosity about people were key to his interview style. He was always well prepared and for his interviews and carefully would read and study the works of his guests. But on the other hand, whenever he interviewed anyone outside his radio studio, um, he often had to ask his guests for help in setting up his tape recorder. Turned out this worked to his advantage and would relieve tension or nervousness between him and his guests. Turkle has said that he improvised the direction of his interviews depending on the responses to his questions. His love of jazz helped to form his interviews, and he liked to begin each one as a jazz musician might approach a song, building on a theme. Because of his vast musical knowledge, he was taken seriously by his guests. By not asking probing or personal questions, treating his guests with respect, and listening to them, he felt they would repay him with honesty and truth. In fact, Turkle explained that the gentlest question is the best one. This approach often made his guests more comfortable to express details about themselves and about their music and what it meant to them. In this interview with a young Bob Dylan, Turkle asks what makes him write a song. You might be surprised at the answer. Well, perhaps this will come along as we're talking and singing to you. I'm asking now about you. And it's hard to separate you from the songs you write and sing. You write most of your songs, don't you? Yeah, I write them all now. Well, what, what makes you write a song? Let's say there's one. I know Pete Seeger sings and Will Holt sings your song. It's a, and you know, I can describe it as a great tapestry. This hard rain is going to fall. Oh, yeah, that one. Well, before you tackle that, what, what made you write that? Well, I'll tell you how I come to write that. Uh, that's just one of them kind of songs. It's just one of those I wrote like that. Was, that was, uh, I wrote that because, uh, you know, every line in that really is another song, you know. It could be used as a whole song, every single line. And I wrote that when uh, I didn't figure, I didn't know how many other songs I could write, you, know, you see. Uh, that was during, uh, I think, October of last year. And uh, I remember sitting up all night and uh, with a bunch of people someplace and uh, I wanted to get the most down that I, that I knew about into one song as I possibly could so I wrote that. It was October mm -hmm. that night. What, that was during a crisis? Yeah, that was during that uh, uh, blockade, I mm -hmm. guess is the word. During Cuba and you worried. So you put yeah, I was, I was a little worried. I can't say I was. Uh, I was, I was so sure fired. Uh, uh, I was, yeah, I was a little worried. Maybe that's the word. <laughs> I so you wrote this song. Mm -hmm. And you call this "Hard Rain Is Gonna Fall," and I know people will be listening to it as you sing it. And uh, that kind of thing. Oh, where have you been, my blue-eyed son? And where have you been, my darling young one? As you heard, Dylan felt like he might never be able to write another song since the country was in the midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis. In answering the question, what makes you write a song, Dylan talked about his motivation and his thoughts and feelings that brought him to write A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. This interview with Janis Joplin was conducted in a noisy dressing room. Turkle asked Joplin how she came to the blues in her hometown of Port Arthur, Texas. Her response tells of her first introduction of the blues and how she found Bessie Smith as an inspiration. 
But you, uh, how'd you come? Gin House. I'm just curious. Port Arthur itself. Oh, uh, it was very strange. Somebody uh, played a Lead Belly record for me one day, and I just freaked. I really liked it, and uh, I started listening to a lot of Lead Belly, and then I started reading books on blues that I found in the library, Port Arthur Library. And uh, they kept mentioning Bessie Smith, and I said, well, fire out a chick blues singer, because I hadn't, hadn't even heard one before. So I ordered all of her records, you know, from where, oh yeah, I had to order them from some strange mail order house, you know. I didn't sell them in Port Arthur. And I just fell in love with her. In the second clip, Turkle's curiosity about why Joplin wasn't interested in popular music of the time reveal, allows her to reveal that it was the soul and truth of the blues that really resonated with her. Coming back to you, and so that was the beginning of the record. Do you remember yeah. when you first, this is curious, going back again? And you hear yeah, I was about uh, 15, 16. And it caught you. Yeah, I never, I didn't listen, to, you know, like kids listen to radio and all, I never listened to radio. I didn't ever get into that rock and roll trip, or I just listened to blues. You know what I'm curious to know, uh, without probing too much, Janice, why it was a, a black woman blues caught you, a white kid of Texas, rather than pop record, say, whether uh, Patty Page. Why was it that? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I just liked your music. It seemed real. It seemed real. It didn't see the others. It seemed so tacky, teenagey. It didn't seem to have any truth in it or something. I don't know. I don't know. I just liked it from the minute I, the first one I ever heard. I was just that was my music. I always liked it. Turkle liked to educate his audience about different types of music, and jazz was one of his major passions. In this clip with pianist Oscar Peterson, Turkle wants to expand what his listeners might consider great music, since WFMT was primarily a classical music station at the time. This is, this is very fascinating. An instrumentalist, we'll come to the matter of, uh, later on perhaps, the matter of Oscar Peterson, the vocalist. And Oscar Peterson, this, uh, the consummate instrumentalist, thinks of the lyric, the words here. And you think of the words of the tune, though you play a wordless instrument. Yes. You, well, in, you in, think of the words of the way. tune, this colors what you do. Yes, definitely, because I think that helps to, to yes. sustain the feel of the tune. Yet, uh, actually, this, it is, in a way, I don't consider it a wordless instrument in that it... Uh, it speaks. The minute you strike it, it speaks. It has its own language, of That's course. Right. If we may, this is by way of introducing many WFMT listeners. I know a great many listeners uh, have not heard jazz, this being primarily a classical music station. Many want to know about it. And we're talking now to perhaps the finest of jazz pianists today, Oscar Peterson. In the next clip, Turkle draws parallels to classical music as he knows both the music and his audience. He asked uh, Peterson about Peterson's humming, which launches an in-depth and articulate explanation about Peterson's process and technique in playing and improvisation. Oops. <laughs> As you were playing a moment ago, the clusters, you did something. And this, I was going to ask you this uh, later, but it, now's the time. You were humming as you were playing. And this is, again, rather intriguing, Toscanini when conducting, and often uh, a lot of recordings after rehearsals, was humming. There was a rehearsal of Traviata, and he was humming as he was playing. Now, would you mind explaining? Well, this, this perhaps could have a, a, a dual reason, Studs. Uh, first of all, when I started music, I play, initially played trumpet, uh, but due to illness, I changed, I reverted back. I started trumpet and piano. Due to illness, I reverted back to piano. Uh, that could be part of it. Uh, hold over from the trumpet playing days, but basically what it is, it's a matter of inflection and articulation. Uh, I think, or I pre-think my phrases, and <clears throat> pardon me, being, uh, being employed playing this particular instrument, uh, I try as much as possible to get a, in certain places, a sort of a fluid uh, attack, the way a horn would. In other words, to run one note into another, to bend a note. Uh, such as if I sang, um, I would try to get that same in impetus on the notes. Instead of the disjointedness. Or even in a, in a harmonic phrase, you try to make it sound as a sax section. 
so I would sing it. And it also helps me with my pedaling. Then I know exactly where to hold over. Uh, basically, it's a, a bit of a bug sometimes in, in a recording studio, but it does help me as far as my artic articulation. It's a habit that I've developed. Blues pianist Memphis Slim sits at the piano during this next interview. Turkle quotes Memphis about the blues and then asks him to explain. Memphis Slim answers him back musically. This is a happy blues, but the basic blues still is the one where a man sings out things he can't say. You once said that. A man sings things he can't say. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, for instance, like a down in the bottom of Mississippi and Arkansas, Georgia, and all of the southern town. When a, a sharecropper, a guy working on a levee camp or something that had a boss that he couldn't talk back to, sometimes he used to say it in music, sing back to him. You know, like a guy used to say, sing a song about, old boss got a pistol, and my boss thinks he's bad. In the next clip, Turkle asks, what's the secret of Boogie Woogie? And displays his knowledge of blues styles by asking Memphis to demonstrate different bass lines. Well, how would you, what is, what's the, uh, the secret of Boogie Woogie? Is it both hands? Is it the rolling bass? Is, is it that the... Uh, the left hand is so strong. Yes, it's more or less the left hand because if you can't play the boogie woogie bass, it really doesn't matter what you're doing with your right hand if you're playing it with your left hand. Well, before you start that, Memphis, would you mind pardon me? What do you mean when they say rolling bass or they say walking? Can you give a demonstration of the difference? They say four to the bar, eight to the bar. Is a way of explaining that musically? Well, the walking bass. Yeah. You can you can play a walking bass with, with a boogie woogie. Sing. <laughs> It would be a rolling bass would be in the 44 blue. Turkle made lasting contributions to the world of music and oral history. His 45-year career on the air left a collection of recordings that are a rich resource documenting American life and the evolution of political and social thought. His interviews with musicians provide us with insight into their lives and the development of their music. The short clips we played are just a tiny fraction of the wealth of rich content available in the Studs Terkel collection. The collection provides additional resources for research on Terkel himself, as well as all the people he interviewed. Researchers may want to trace Terkel's history from a radio disc jockey to a renowned oral historian, study different interpretations of musical styles, or examine the nation's responses to historical and cultural events throughout the 20th century. These are just a few examples of how the collection might be used. Currently, about a quarter of the collection is digitized and available in the Recorded Sound Reference Center at the Library of Congress. The rest of the collection is being processed and will be available in the future. The Chicago History Museum is looking at options for access, but doesn't have a plan in place yet. Thank you. 
Okay. My second question regards uh, Stutz Terkel. Yes. Uh, I understand that he not only wrote 18 books, but he had a daily radio program over many, many years. So he could not possibly have done that by himself. He must have had staff, a rather large staff at that, to research his interview partners, uh, to, to contact the people, to prepare the questions. Um, have you found any such metadata, and have you tried to talk to the people who prepared his radio programs? Uh, well, I don't. I know that he had a lot of staff at WFMT to help him. There's um, a couple books that document that with um, his staff uh, to do exactly what you said to help prepare, find, you know, help him do this. Um, but no, we didn't interview them because that's not part of the collection. We are just, um, our presentation and, and what we're doing is just the collection from the Chicago History Museum that they have. So um, I'm sure there's more documentation and, and about that. But what we were talking about was just what we've received from the you know, um, Chicago History Museum. Um, a question for both of you. Once you have reproduced the original source material onto the medium that you then sure. use for your day-to-day -day research needs. What's your policies and technology that you use for the long-term storage of the original medium? And what's your policy for yeah. somebody if they come in and request to listen not to the first generation reissue, but to the original source material? Well, as far as I know, and um, the original source material goes back to the Chicago History Museum, mm -hmm. and we'll have the we have will have made copies of that, um, and so anyone can listen to them, can come in and request to listen to them at our reading room in Washington D.C. Um, so, are you asking if you want a copy of the material, or as for the long-term storage, there? I can, they're on hard drives, I'll let my The, the question essentially is, does the original material then become especially cocooned for very, very long-term preservation, or does it just become n subject to normal archival protocols? Are you talking about the, the reels, like the, the tapes, or? Correct, or, yeah. or wire recordings, or you know, quarter-inch tapes. Uh, do they once it's reproduced, mm -hmm. so so that you know you're using it for everyday use? Right. Bang, bang around. Doc, does the original material then become virtually hermetically sealed for 50 or 100 year storage, or Pretty does it just become normally normal archivally stored? Um, both, I think. I mean, we're going to be accessing the digital files, but we're going to be storing the original. Well, we actually we're sending them back to Chicago history, so for now we're storing them in our vaults. But um, the originals the will origin go back to the Chicago History Museum. So I think I, what I'm under what I understand your question is, you would have to contact the Chicago History Museum and ask them what they plan to do with the original source <laughs> materials. I'll just um, mention, since I, I know they're set up there, they have, cold, they, have, they have cold storage. They have a very good cold storage facility. And so I imagine those are going back. And they will attempt to remove from use anything that's been copied. Uh, but uh, the the also with the library. The library's yeah. policy is yeah. to preserve, but all, you know, not, not mm -hmm transfer, but to also preserve the original. Yeah. Yeah, those are always kept in their kept in archive conditions. But we won't have the original. We're not having the originals. We're not going to keep those. Right. Yeah. 